All right, okay. So it's our pleasure to have doc, Dr. Ardun here today. And uh, Ardun is a PI from LIS at MIT. He's also affiliated with the Argonne National Labs. Uh, Ardun did a lot of important work in energy storage, which he will be talking about today. And uh, with that, Ardun, please take it away. Great. Thank you, Boss, and thank you so much for uh, the kind invitation to uh, give a talk in this uh, colloquium series. Uh, it's um, uh, these are interesting days for uh, energy and electricity markets. Um, I, uh, as you said, I spend my I, I work here in, in Boston at MIT. Um, I'm also affiliated with Argo National Lab, uh, and I have. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with graduates and students from the University of Washington and the ECE department uh, on multiple occasions, uh, with most, most lately with Bolun Zhu, who uh, was a postdoc here before he went, to, went on to Columbia as a faculty, uh, and also through Argonne with, with summer uh, intern, interns in, in the past. So I want to make sure to, to point out at the outset, if there are some students out there, graduate students looking for intern uh, opportunities, uh, uh, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, with that, uh, I so I, I know I made this title a while back on energy storage in future electricity markets. That's something I'm working on quite a bit, both at MIT and Argonne. Um, and I want to you know touch on some of the topics uh, that we work on in that space. Uh, but not only I decided not only to focus on future electricity markets, given all the uh, attention the uh, the crisis in Texas uh, has uh, received in the last uh, few days and, and, and in particular last week. So I decided to also include a little bit about what happened in, in Texas because that is very much uh, related to market design questions which have been around for a long time about electricity markets. Um, so this is the outline of my talk uh, with a brief background and then a few topics on energy storage analysis uh, here. Uh, I will see if I, I get to cover all of them. <clears throat> so uh, just a little bit of data to start with. We, you all know that renewables has grown uh, rapidly in, in the power grid in the US and many other places in the world in the last uh, uh, decades or so. Uh, they, I found this uh, illustration interesting because it kind of provides a historical perspective on the use of renewables, that is wind, solar and hydro. Um, well, all, all renewables, re renewables actually compared to coal in the US and you can see that for the first time back in 2019 renewables provided more primary energy than coal for the first time for about 150 years, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a historical uh, transition that we are experience, experiencing here if you look at this from the long term perspective. Um, Energy storage has received a lot of attention as well uh, in, in recent years. And this is the uh, development of uh, installed capacity and new capacity each year up until 2019. I got this from a colleague of mine in the MIT Energy Initiative, uh, Apurba Sakti. Uh, and it also includes projections for the next few years. And as you can see, there is uh, expectation of substantial growth for batteries. Um, in the grid in, in the next few years. Uh, if you look at the breakdown here between areas, you can see Cal ISO, California is expected to get the most storage. And I think they have already in part due to their storage mandate. Um, I should add though that this is battery capacity. The big storage resource out there today is PEM storage hydro, which is about 95% of energy storage uh, in, 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 in the grid. We shouldn't forget about that. Uh, another interesting data point is here, uh, kind of illustrating a transition potentially happening here. This is the market value of uh, three companies. I'm sure you've heard of ExxonMobil and Chevron, big oil and gas companies. Uh, Next Era is the largest owner of wind and solar power in, in the US and, and the world. And as it happened back in Sometime last fall, uh, the market value of next year actually exceeded Exxon and Chevron for a while at least. I just checked and now it's the other way around. So, you know, we'll see how this trend continues, but it's kind of an interesting data point here. Um, 
So I find this backdrop with more interest in renewables um, and uh, you know, the corresponding challenges very interesting. So if I want to describe briefly what I work on in my research at MIT and Argonne, uh, it is, is about questions around how to enable um, the transition towards uh, a cleaner energy system. Uh, how do we plan and operate systems with uh, more renewables in them? Uh, and also I'm interested in the market perspective, how to design these markets, which are com very complex because you, know, you have to combine physical principles with the economics. Um, and then, you know, what is the role of emerging technologies such as energy storage? So it's a very interdisciplinary area of research. So I like to say that we have a pretty large toolbox that we put to use here, you know, including uh, power systems engineering, but also energy economics and policy, operations research and decision theory, uh, in particular under uncertainty, uh, sometimes use game theory or agent-based simulations, and uh, machine learning as well, and statistics is gaining in increasing interest, obviously, in our field uh, as well. So. Uh, I like this illustration because we don't want to end up, uh, you know, we, we need to have uh, a range of tools to avoid ending up, uh, up, up here in, in this area. <clears throat> okay, so uh, a little bit of math. This is the traditional power system scheduling problem. Um, and for those of you who work in this area, this has been around for a long time. It's the problem of minimizing the cost or meeting electricity demand, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time, which could be the next day or the next hours. Uh, so the objective is to minimize cost. Um, subject to system constraints, you have to meet uh, the energy balance, the energy demand in all the nodes. Uh, you have to keep sufficient reserves, and you have to account for the transmission network. And then you have also unit level constraints for power plants uh, and other um, assets in the grid. So in terms of research, there's a lot of research in terms of how do you deal with uncertainty, uh, given more renewables in the system? Um, how do you represent new types of assets like energy storage down in the unit level constraints? Uh, how do you deal with non-convex cost elements in the objective function? Uh, pricing questions around that uh, and also on the transmission side that you know the full blown ac power flow equations are, are non-convex and very hard to deal with you know are you able to convexify that and at least approximate the full uh, transmission flow uh, from a physics perspective so lots of interesting questions you know from like a physical scheduling perspective but also in terms of market uh, clearing prices and incentives uh, and, and us markets are based on locational marginal prices um, this map shows um, prices at a snapshot in time uh, within the PGM and, and MISO markets. Those are the two largest markets. And it, as you can see, it's a colorful, colorful map with some prices um, in the negative territory here uh, in this purple area. And then also other areas with high prices occurring at the same time because of transmission congestion in, in the network. So, you know, th this th directly reflects physical constraints in the system. So solving these problems are, are large scale mathematical optimization problems that gives incentives to all the market participants out there. Okay, so this is a snapshot from Texas uh, and the electricity market in Texas, which is called ERCOT from uh, last week, just uh, uh, you know, many of us were following the, the situation closely there. This just happened to be at 10 o'clock. I think it was last Thursday. Uh, and as you, can see, as you can see in the day ahead market, it's all deep red. So the prices were basically at $9,000 per megawatt hour uh, across the board here uh, because of the, the, the crisis that unfolded. And that's a pretty, a very high price for electricity when you think about it. Uh, and that was the market reaction to the shortage of electricity supply um, in, in Texas that we've all, uh, all heard about. So, you know, given that I work on this topic, uh, I, I, uh, I, I looked into some more, more details here about what, what actually happened. Uh, probably some of you, many of you may have looked at this as well, but I wanted to show some, some um, graphs here, illustrations, this became, headline news, you know, electricity markets all of a sudden, uh, given the crisis there. So 
basically this is from the wall street journal um uh, what happened is that you had this winter weather very cold winter weather moving in um and here on the, in the morning of the 15th you got this sudden um you know the, the load was increasing due to higher um uh, demands but at the same time the cold weather prevented many resources from generating electricity so what is shown here is the forecasted uh, demand in, in yellow and the realized demand in, in red so the difference is an estimate of the, the amount of electricity service that had to be cut back in, in the system over three days or so here and as you can see it's a pretty it's a very large amount of electricity about 20 more than 20,000 uh, megawatt hours uh, at every hour here, or at least in some hours. Uh, and on the supply side, you see here, uh, when this all started, all of a sudden there was a big drop in generation from thermal resources up here, and renewables also saw a more gradual drop in, in production um, just at the outset of this, this, uh, this event. And, you know, it, uh, it stayed at low levels for, for multiple days here creating the, the trouble we, we heard about. Uh, so this is another way of looking at it. ERCOT, the system operator in Texas, they they uh, you know they they make plans, they they monitor the market, they assess the situation and back in November they they issued this statement where they anticipated that there would be sufficient installed capacity in, in their system. Um, their forecasted peak um, under normal conditions was uh, this line here, around 58 gigawatts. Um, and then they have an, an extreme demand forecast peak of something around 67 uh, gigawatts up there. And you can see the in, in the backdrop there, this is the actual demand on the February 15, which uh, in, in blue and the realized demand in, in, in uh, in green, and you can see that the actual demand well exceeded the, the expectation of, of the, um, the system operator and probably most other uh, people out there. So, you know, this was a really uh, extreme amount of load that was driven by, by, by the weather. Uh, you can go and look at, you know, in more detail, what were the different generation resources doing? There's a lot of blame game going out there. Um, and as this graph shows, you know, natural gas units were the ones that dropped off the most, but also wind power, coal fired generation, and even nuclear. They lost one nuclear unit here during this, this cold spell. And it took a lot of time for, for uh, the situation to, to stabilize. So, um, and this affected four, more than 4 million people that ended up without power, some of them for three, four days in very cold weather. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a big problem, obviously. Um, so with that, that crisis, introduction to the crisis, so a couple of things about Texas is that it, it is uh, a market, a system that has um, integrated a lot of wind power over the years. It's actually by far the state which has the highest amount of, of wind power uh, at about 31 gigawatts. Now, we saw that that wasn't Perhaps uh, probably not the main problem to the to the to uh, to this uh, crisis last week, but it's an interesting uh, observation. And uh, you know, some people out there uh, have been bringing up this uh, challenge of operating the grid with more renewables in in this con context. Um, so that's that's one interesting characteristic. Another interesting characteristic with the workout market is how they deal with resource adequacy. Um, basically how they ensure that there is sufficient capacity available to meet demand. Um, this map shows how different uh, markets do this in the US. So the colored areas have like organized markets. The gray areas are more traditionally regulated areas. Um, and there are different approaches out there in the East and uh, Midwest. Uh, we have capacity markets where they clear an auction to make sure that there is enough capacity available um, to meet peak load projections. Uh, in California and in the SPP market, they have a similar capacity obligation imposed on, on, 
uh, utilities or load serving entities, but they don't have a centralized capacity market. Whereas ERCOT uh, stands out because it basically relies on prices in the short term, short term energy market to provide incentives for uh, sufficient investments. Um, th this, you know, these solutions, these challenges have been there since the outset of electricity restructuring um, in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, um, they are still being discussed what's the best approach, and I'm sure that discussion is going to uh, intensify after the um, experience in ERCOT last week. Um, Although, you know, it's hard to say what would have happened with a different market that, you know, becomes speculation. So this is an old problem and it's also covered in the very good textbook Professor Kirshen wrote about power system economics uh, about 15 years ago or so. <clears throat> so uh, just some observations from the ERCOT um, or Texas crisis. It does illustrate how important it is that we have a reliable supply of electricity. Um, it shows these interdependencies between different uh, energy infrastructures. We saw the link between gas, the gas supply systems, which ended up with problems because of the coal and how that prevented uh, gas fired power plants to have a fuel for their generation. Um, and we saw the link between electricity and heating, obviously, given that quite a few people use electricity for heating there. And also the, the fact that, uh, um, you know, water pipes ended up freezing and water supply facilities didn't have power to run their system. So, you know, there were lots of domino effects uh, resulting from the lack of electricity uh, over that time period. Another important observation is obviously extreme weather events. This was, uh, a very, you know, an outlier for sure in the distribution that they didn't plan for. Um, and uh, it's impossible to say whether this was directly due to climate change, but I think we know that climate change creates these types of extremes. So uh, we need to think about that when we plan systems for the future. So in this illustration, uh, which is an old illustration, it kind of shows the trade off between investing in re reliability which include in increases the supply, the cost of supplying the system. Uh, but by doing that, you reduce the cost of unserved energy. And the total cost is what you want to, from, from an optimization perspective, minimize. And finding that, that optimal solution um, becomes increasingly complex with uh, a different weather pattern, with more other technologies in the loop. Um, so it's an important, you know, technical question, how to identify that, and also how do we get to the rely on market mechanisms or, or uh, more centralized planning. Uh, and it's important to keep in mind that in California, they have a very different approach to, to planning. They also experienced the, the, uh, the, this, this uh, much smaller blackouts in, in the summer due, due to, to more demand than expected uh, during the, the summer peak there. So th these issues are likely to affect many systems out there. Okay, that was a brief background and uh, uh, my current sort of take on the crisis in Texas. Uh, it's been occupying me quite a bit lately, so I wanted to include that. Um, now let's turn to energy storage analysis um, and some of the topics that, that we're working on in, in that domain. Uh, um, by the way, feel free to, to ask questions. I think they're mainly at the end, but happy to also take any clarifying questions along the way here. <clears throat> so let's start with one topic I added a little bit in the context of what's going on in uh, in Texas, uh, and that is this question of capacity credits. Um, and that basically been, mean for different resources in the power grid, different generation resources, how much firm capacity do you, can you assume that each type of resource provides to the, to the grid? Um, and, and they're looking at variable renewables, so wind and solar, in combination with, with energy storage, um, with the um, underlying assumption that energy storage could be used to shift outputs from these variable resources to times of scarcity. If you look at how this is done, capacity credit calculations in most of the areas which I showed which have capacity markets, um, 
and also in other areas which do the same type of calculations. Actually, they are typically based on historical outputs from variable renewable energy sources during certain performance hours. Uh, uh, and typically this is done through probabilistic analysis, either analytically with convolution approaches or Monte Carlo type of sim simulations that are typically done at one snapshot at a time without considering chronological relationships over time. So I did this work with Connie Byers, who was a master student at MIT. We, we looked at this um, reliability assessment and capacity credit estimates uh, in a system which is assumed to have energy storage in it uh, as a starting point. And then we add a, a variable renewable energy source in, into the mix. And we want to estimate how much firm capacity does that um, new resource add to the system. Uh, and we do this by running simulations, a number of simulations for different uh, realizations of uncertainty. In this case, we focus on wind uncertainty. And then we come up with the types of curves we see here for non-served energy and NSE. Um, and if you do this in the base case, that is without considering new renewable capacity, then we get this curve up here. Uh, and the reliability target is uh, it's, it's, uh, the frequency of unserved energy, so loss of load hours. Uh, it's uh, a commonly used uh, target. So if, if, you know, if your line here uh, crosses this target above zero, you have a capacity shortage in the system. You, know, you, need, you need this much more capacity CB here to meet your reliability target. Uh, next, we calculate a standalone value for variable renewable simply by subtracting the amount of uh, renewable production in each hour of unserved energy. And that gives us this dotted line here. Uh, so using this approach, which kind of treats the renewable resource in isolation, we calculate a new amount of firm capacity that's needed to meet the goal. And the difference is the standalone capacity value of that renewable resource. And finally, we take the integrated approach where we resolve the stochastic dispatch over time. And in that case, energy storage in particular changes its operation in light to renewables and it brings down the curve uh, further. So uh, we get uh, an integrated value which is larger than um, the standalone value. So there is a synergy effect here that, that give, gives you a larger um, firm capacity value for for uh, when you com consider the synergy between these these two resources. So we repeat the same exercise to using a different reliability me metric that is uh, expected unserved energy instead of loss of load hours, and then it's the area under the the graph of unserved energy that matters. We keep this constant uh, across these three simulations, and we can derive similar standalone and integrated values for firm capacity uh, for, for wind farm and the combination of wind farm and energy storage. Uh, and we summarize this using like a simple test system and, and the key message here without going into too much detail. So we do this for uh, the two different metric, metrics and two different or different targets, reliability targets. And the key message is that in, in most of the cases, the integrated value is larger than the standalone one. So there is a significant portfolio effect uh, that comes from the interaction between, between uh, renewables and energy storage. So, and to assess that, we need to do chronological dispatch simulations rather than uh, evaluating reliability in snapshots. We see that the reliability metric is important. Uh, we argue that expected unserved energy has some advantages. Um, we do, do, do find that this portfolio effect is significant and that it should be accounted for or at least studied in more detail uh, for you know, uh, ISOs and others who do these types of reliability assessments. An important next question becomes, how do you assign this synergy effect, this additional capacity credit? Um, which emerges from this you know, combination of resources in the grid. You know, the way capacity markets work is that you assign a capacity credit individ you know, for individual resources without considering these effects. And, and the real value of the capacity uh, credits for a resource depend on the, the mix of resources in the grid. So uh, that's an important question to consider uh, as we move forward with, with, uh, with these market markets. 
Okay, so that was um, briefly on the capacity credits with renewables and storage. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit here. Um, and this is work uh, I'm doing in collaboration with, uh, with people in, in chemical engineering here at MIT and Professor Fikil Bruchette's group. Um, we have completed a, a project where we try to combine the uh, sort of the world that I, I live in uh, over here on electricity markets, rules and regulations, uh, you know, dispatch of the grid with the world of batteries, uh, different types of, of, of storage technologies, um, and potentially, you know, accessible both existing and potentially new, new types of chemistries that can be used for energy storage. Uh, uh, and the idea is that Already at the early stage of developing and testing storage options, battery options, you account for expected use cases, applications of storage in the power grid. Typically, when you test batteries, you do that based on very simple standardized uh, testing regimes, no, no simple full discharge charge cycles repeated uh, many times. But the world, of course, is very different when you install uh, energy storage in the power grid. So the idea is kind of at the high level to inform the work that the, the chemistry chemists do in, in the lab by some realistic uh, applications in, in the power system. So one example of, of uh, an application of energy storage is that is energy arbitrage, basically uh, buying when the price in, in the market is low and selling when it's high. And um, so on our end, we developed this optimization model. It's not, it's relatively straightforward. It's a simple buy-sell buy problem, basically. But we focused on, you know, we have the market prices as input to the algorithm, but we focus on, on the characterization of the, of the energy storage device. And in this case, in particular, uh, flow batteries, vanadium redox flow batteries, and how to represent those within the uh, optimization problem. Um, to do that, we came up with this representation of, of, of uh, losses in this uh, flow battery cell as a function of, uh, well, first of all, output power, but also we have different curves for different state of charge levels. These percentages refer to different state of, of charge. So at the low state of charge, you can get much less uh, out of your battery than what you do at uh, intermediate and high level, levels of charge here. And the state of charge also determines the maximum amount of power you can, you can uh, extract from your battery. And this type of stepwise linear uh, curves are easy to integrate in the optimization problem here. Uh, and that's what, what we did. You know, we had a basic model where efficiency is constant and power limits are constant. And then we have a more advanced limit, which account for those piecewise linear curves to represent uh, in some what more detail the inner workings of the, of the battery. Uh, and just to show some examples of results here, this is for uh, three, three different days. What happens is that the basic model um, typically underestimates the amount of revenue you can get from, from, the, uh, from doing arbitrage with the battery because of inefficient uh, operation. So that's the difference between the red and blue, blue curves here. The detail model takes advantage of the different uh, curves I showed on the previous uh, um, slide to, to optimize uh, efficiency uh, considerations within the battery. And these have, you know, been our simulations uh, over a year, could have quite significant impacts on the uh, estimated revenue uh, from, the, from, the, from the market. You can see the compared numbers in, in the table here. Uh, and, and in short, the reason for that is that with the, adding those details into the, into the model, the, the battery ends up operating at, at higher efficiencies. Whereas the basic model gives a more con conservative operational profile and therefore also, also fewer cycles um, or, or less use of the battery. Well, this work doesn't consider degradation, and that's the that is uh, an, another topic that that uh, is getting. I know attention uh, at your university as well as, as, as elsewhere. So that's another um, 
issue when it comes to batteries that we are we are looking at uh, and battery degradation um, from what what I understand from talking about uh, the, the chemists who work on this is that that is, is a very complicated process but basically uh, it depends on a number of different factors you know it depends on how you use the battery depends on, on, on temperature, it, it depends on uh, how old the battery is and, and so, so, so forth. Um, this, this illustration here indicates that um, when we say battery degradation, we oftentimes may, mainly talk about how much capacity you have left in the battery. So typically the, the capacity fade is relatively linear. Um, uh, to start with, but then at some point you reach this, this knee where accelerated uh, aging occurs and there is not much life left in the battery really at, at, at this point. Um, and the end of life criteria is, you know, there's a range of assumptions for what you assume is, is the cut of, of, of the lifetime uh, of, of the battery. Um, but the, you know, the exact degradation, its shape depends on the application in the grid. Uh, and there is quite a bit to work on, on, on uh, incorporating degradation in operational problems, including the work by Balloon and uh, you guys at the uh, University of, of Washington. Uh, but there has been less attention in generation expansion planning so far. Uh, and that's one area we have been looking at uh, Recently, where we uh, we use a pretty simple degradation model, where uh, there we split the degradation into two parts. One is calendar degradation; that's a process you cannot affect; it just happens as a function of time. But then this, the the second part, the cycle uh, the cycle degradation, is is uh, is a function of how you use the battery. Uh, and we assume that you know the total degradation of the battery is the sum of these two components. Um, and we, we uh, have this small scale distributed type of, of power system expansion planning problem where we test out different degradation uh, representation. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's a problem where you try to minimize the total cost, investment and operational costs uh, subject to the energy balance, the constraints on the units, and also we have a battery model that consider cycling and, and, and degradation. Uh, and when it comes to degradation, the, it impacts how we represent investment costs of the battery. In the case with no degradation, we assume that the investment cost is, uh, is only a function of how much power and capacity the battery has. Uh, you know, it's similar to how you treat investment costs for a power plant. If you do consider degradation, it becomes uh, the amount of degradation uh, for the energy capacity is this is the sum of the calendar degradation and the cycle degradation. So, so we assume that the investment cost actually is a function of how much you, you use, how much of the capacity you use due to degradation. And we show that um, um, we, we solve this model for a full year with different uh, representation of, of, of the battery. In this case, it's a lithium ion battery. <coughs> and the first two models, <clears throat> um, the first one is the simplest one. It cons, you know, cons, everything is, is, is constant basically and no degradation. In the second one, we add this element of dynamic uh, losses and power limits. And then in the third model, we add, third and fourth model, we add degradation in, into the, into the uh, problem as I briefly described. Uh, and the key finding here is that once you Add degradation into the uh, into the model. Your result starts changing quite significantly. In particular, the amount of storage you invest in increases substantially, and some of the older investments are reduced accordingly. And this has implications for uh, the costs from the system, also and the dispatch of all the resources uh, and the emissions as well. So. Uh, our, our sort of, from a modeling perspective, we conclude that it's very important to factor degradation into account in, in the generation expansion planning problem. Uh, these details about efficiency and power limits are not as important when it comes to the, comes to the planning problem. 
Okay, so um, that's a brief overview of work we are doing on trying to to improve the representation of, of batteries in, in power system optimization models. Uh, we are also interested in, in this from more of an economic per market perspective. Um, um, this is a working paper uh, we, uh, we, I wrote with a colleague, old colleague, Magnus Korpos, who is a professor in, in Norway, my, my university where I did my PhD. He was a visiting professor here in, at MIT and Leeds. Uh, and one of the things we were discussing was this whole problem of, of cost recovery in electricity markets, which has uh, more renewables as well as energy storage. Um, and we wrote this working paper, which is currently under review. And, and here we, we uh, ignore all these detailed uh, representations of storage, and we take more of a bit of an analytical approach to analyzing these, these problems from a market uh, system optimum and market equilibrium perspective. Uh, and the, the short, short summary is that there's a lot of uh, discussion out there about the, the viability of electricity markets uh, when they uh, see more and more renewables in, in the system. Uh, and one of the factors is that these resources have zero marginal cost and that this may lead to a collapse of prices and that costs are not recovered in, in, the, in the long run. Um, now based on a stylized analysis and just briefly describe to you, we, we uh, find that under uh, certain conditions, uh, assumptions, the, all plants, including renewables and storage can still recover their costs, um, even in an energy only market like, like the one in, in Texas, by the way. Um, so it's not necessarily to redesign markets completely. Uh, you know, maybe it's sufficient to to make some uh, adjustments and uh, uh, instead of a complete uh, uh, redesign. Um, so the approach we take here is that we study system optimality and. Uh, uh, and cost recovery by using a traditional way of representing uh, load in, in the grid by using a so-called load duration curve approach. Uh, this has a lot of shortcomings. It assumes inelastic man, demand, no chronological effects, you know, no operating reserves, but it's been used in some of the, the classical literature on the, uh, on, on the topic. Uh, under the most basic traditional in the traditional case, we assume that there is a base load plant and a peak load plant. Um, and you want to find the optimal mix of capacities, X peak, X base, uh, and they're both assumed to have a fixed and a variable cost. Um, and you can set this up. Um, you can derive the optimality conditions. That's a, it's a straightforward exercise in, in the conventional case. Um, and you get that this durations here, which are shown in the figure, TS, it, that's the duration of, of, um, of a shortfall of supply in the system. So there is load curtailment happening, uh, you know, up until this TS time here. Uh, and then TP is the time the peak is operating. Uh, and then the base load plant is assumed to operate all the time here. Uh, and the optimality condition gives you optimal durations, TS and TP, uh, time for load trading and time for peaking plant operation as a function of the fixed and variable costs of the generation resources as well as the, as the assumed uh, value of lost load during load shedding. Uh, and you can show that by formulating this as a profit maximization problem instead, by taking the derivative of the profit for each technology, you can show that you get the same, same conditions, uh, optimality condition, and that cost recovery is ensured. Uh, and that's, you know, that's been done uh, way back. But what we do is that we expand this uh, analysis, which is still very, you know, it's based on very simple assumptions, but we have expanded to include variable renewables. That's the illustration on the on the left hand side here, then you do the exercise based on a net load duration curve instead of the original load duration curve. Um, and you get an additional time duration value here. That's the, at the time where um, renewables meet all the load to the right of this time period. 
And also, with, uh, if you add energy storage, we have to assume something about how storage is shifting energy around in, in the system. Um, but it's still possible to derive the same type of optimality conditions. Uh, and uh, the result basically shows that also under these you know, simplistic uh, uh, representations of renewables and storage, we get the same result that uh, profit maximization for the individual technologies give the same solution as the system cost minimization. And when it comes to storage, that adds some additional price segments in the market, which uh, account for charging and discharging efficiencies. And overall, the re variable renewables and energy storage, if they are competitive, they will, will uh, contribute to reduce the overall cost or overall price in, in the system. Um, so this is, you know, we derive these conditions for the, the durations, TS, TP, and, and, and etc. And then you can easily uh, find the optimal capacities from the net low duration curve here. That's basically how it works. Uh, and we also have a small example where we show the first the traditional case with just a peak and a base load plant. Then we add wind to the system and we get less base and more peak to accommodate the, the wind power generation. And if we add storage, we also get uh, some storage capacity that reduces the amount of peaking capacity and increases the amount of of wind power in the system. And if you look at the prices that result from these three configurations, um, you can see that in the third case, um, this is the price duration curve. So similar to the low duration curve, it sorts the price in descending order. Uh, and it shows that you get additional steps on the price duration curve once you have storage in the system. And overall, the amount, the weighted average price um, is decreased as expected when you add re renewables and energy storage to the to the mix because they are uh, competitive technologies that that uh, kind of take their share of the market based on based on economics. Um, so in principle, you know these technologies could uh, exist, coexist, and, and uh, record their cost based on energy energy prices. Okay, so um, the next uh, example here is is uh, is very exciting work that Balloon uh, Sue, the postdoc that came from University of Washington, uh, did while he was uh, at MIT. So he he uh, he did uh, develop. You know, he was interested in the computational aspect of energy storage control. It's it's a complex problem because of the intertemporal dynamics that you have to account for. So he developed a toolbox for, for storage control. Um, the first paper uh, is, is for a deterministic uh, system, and the second pa paper is on under stochastic uh, prices. Uh, and and um, it, you know, it can consider a, a general objective function that also could include battery degradation costs. Uh, a good thing about uh, Bolun's work is that he made all the code available uh, on his uh, GitHub site if you're interested in looking at it. Uh, and this is, you know, so Bullion is has a very strong um, mathematical background, so he he went about this in a rigorous way, and uh, he basically, uh, or I should say that the starting point actually for for this work was that we had discussions around how is this being done in in hydro dominated system, how do they optimize their uh, reservoir management? I I come from. Uh, from Norway, and you know, I had my education and did my PhD there. And uh, over the years, they have become very good at optimizing the, the reservoir <laughs> management uh, of their hydropower plants. And, and the key is really to estimate what's the marginal value of energy in your reservoirs. So, in a way, we are, are uh, inspired by the same approach here to find the marginal value of charge in your storage device. And that's the, the, the theta here that, that uh, is the kind of key uh, dual variable, the dual variable of the energy storage balance that, that Balloon uh, found a way to find the optimal uh, uh, theta to then guide the overall dispatch of, of, of the system. So, you know, he went about this in a rigorous way. Um, but the key here is that when you operate storage, um, you need to stay between your upper and lower 
uh, state of charge level. Um, and the, this marginal value, the theta on the energy storage constraint remains the same until you reach either the upper or lower uh, constraint. And he, uh, he found, you know, he derived up an optimal policy in closed form format, and he de devised this very efficient search algorithm, basically by picking a random X, which is your guess at this theta value, and then he simulates the, uh, the evolution of the storage state of charge in the battery um, until it reaches either the upper or lower limit. If it reaches the upper limit, you know that your, your value was, was uh, too high, so you lower it, and vice versa if you reach the lower limit. And, and he shows that this converges to the optimal solution. Uh, and the, the uh, uh, numerical results are very impressive. This is a comparison between solving the problem with a standard solver, Groby, for different uh, look-ahead horizons, which is basically uh, you know, proportional to the size of the problem. Uh, and that grows you know, quite fast, as you can see, as you increase the size of the problem. Bolin's algorithm has, is on the time to solve. is almost constant, um, regardless of the look-ahead look horizon. So that, that's the deterministic case. He also did uh, a similar algorithm for the, for the stochastic case. So, from a computational and control perspective, this this is very uh, very good work, I think, and um, you know, with, with potential for for many applications out there when you need to solve this problem uh, very very fast. Okay, uh, let me. This is the last example I have. It's it's a new paper that um, uh, Patrick Brown. He was a postdoc here at MIT. He's now at NREL. He was working on this uh, for for quite a while. It's it's a uh, a study of, of uh, reaching or how to potentially reach zero carbon electricity in in the U.S. Um, the uh, when we were working on this, so he uh, he focused on the year 2040 uh, and how a system could be designed to reach that goal in 2040. Uh, I, I thought that was a very you know, ambitious goal. And now, of course, the new administration has the goal of reaching this by 2035. So uh, <laughs> maybe we have to be even more ambitious here. Um, but the key here is that the uh, it's a large scale transmission and generation expansion planning model. And we are zooming in and focusing on what's the value of, of transmission in, in reaching uh, this zero carbon goal. Um, and it, you know, it, it's uh, built on a number of simplifications, uh, obviously, but it's nice because it's national in scope and it has a very detailed representation of the resource potential in different states and, and region, regions. Uh, and what we do, or what Patrick did, was to solve first for each individual state, then for 11 regions, and then finally for the entire interconnected systems with different assumptions for how much transmission you can build out between, between them. Um, and and the, the starting point is a fully renewable uh, power system, but we also run uh, sensitivities with nuclear uh, and also some cases without this carbon constraint in the system. Uh, it's a lot of detailed assumptions about uh, input data. These are resource supply curves for wind and solar for different regions, um, then different cases that go from the local state one and all the way to the a uh, fully coordinated case at the bottom of the table here where you, where you do both coordination and transmission planning across, across the nation. Uh, and the key message here is really that if you allow for and are able to do transmission planning, the cost of, of meeting this zero carbon electricity drops substantially for what is the case if you try to do this for each individual state. Uh, so, so that's kind of shows the benefit of, of building out transmission capacity. Um, it also shows that in terms of energy storage, if you do that this regionally, you need a lot of storage. If you do it across the nation, you need much less storage. Uh, the capacity mix you get is a combination of wind and solar and some energy storage. And you get a lot of uh, more, more available energy than what you use because it's more efficient to spill energy at times rather than to store it and, and, and reuse it. As you, can, you can see the, how the amount of transmission expansion increases between these uh, cases going from 
left to right here. Um, you can drill in, in in more detailed results at the regional level. Um, in this case, on the right hand side, we assumed full transmission expansion. Uh, and I just looked at this last night. Interestingly enough, there is a lot of expansion going on from from Texas to the to the rest of the system. Currently, there is almost no capacity connecting Orco to the rest of the grid. Um, but from a pure cost minimization perspective, that that would make a lot of sense. Uh, and the amount of transmission also affects the, the resource mix in different portfolios. Um, it, uh, uh, if you do this, this, this comp compares what's the cost of going from no carbon policy to 100% uh, to or to zero carbon. Uh, and what this graph basically shows is that if you do it at the state level, it becomes very expensive. If you do it across the nation on the right hand side here, the increase in cost is, is much more, more moderate. Okay, um, I will leave a bit of time for questions. So I'll, I think I'll, I'll um, just wrap up here. Um, in terms of electricity markets, the recent experience in Texas really shows us the importance of considering extreme events. Um, and also that, you know, there's a lot of talk about uh, all the challenges due to their uncertainty from variable renewables, but obviously older generation resources are exposed to uncertainties as well. And this trade-off between cost and reliability becomes uh, increasingly complex uh, with, with changing weather patterns and uh, new resources uh, in, in, the, in the mix. I like to think of solutions to renewable integration in terms of hardware you know, solutions, installing more stuff in the grid, like energy storage, uh, transmission and, and other other uh, infrastructure, but also equally important, I think, it's to improve the algorithms, you know, to consider probabilistic forecasting, uh, to improve operational practices, to use stochastic or, or perhaps robust types of tools. Um, at the same time, you shouldn't forget about the market design and the price and um, price incentives that follow from market design and energy policy. And the storage analytics is particularly interesting and challenging uh, because of the fact that you have to deal with this intertemporal relationships as well as the physical characteristics of the electrochemistry of batteries. Uh, and I do think that this area of, of research is really exciting. I'm very happy to work on these types of problems. So, uh, and I think there are lots of problems out there to, to still solve for those of you who are uh, about to graduate soon. So. With that, that, that's what I had. Thanks, thanks, Jesse. Thanks for this great talk. Uh, now let's open up for questions. Any question from the audience? Uh, William, you can just ask if you want. You can just uh, unmute and ask. Yeah, uh, I was curious if um, with the combined battery model, um, were there uh, you talked about battery degradation, but were there were there specific, I don't know, like uh, new metrics that you came up with for battery design that wouldn't have been considered for like uh, typical storage or other storage application? Uh, well, I, I didn't, you know, um, not sure if you come up with specific criteria or designs, but. Um, what we are looking at, one thing is, is uh, for, um, for vanadium or for, for flow batteries in particular, that, that was the storage technology we focused on. And, and one of the uh, key uh, benefits of that, that technology is that degradation, at least most of the degradation actually is reversible. So you, you can, you can uh, you know, do certain operations, you can mix the tanks basically, and then you, you, you re-establish your, your, uh, your capacity in, in the battery. So, so one of the problems that, that kind of emerged from that work was to look at that as a decision problem. At what point in time do you, do you decide to do that rebalancing of the system to regain your, your uh, uh, capacity level? Um, okay, great. Any other questions? Any more questions? Hey, Dawson, it's Isma. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Isma. Please go ahead. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, 
I look at this, so, so the University of Washington is kind enough to invite industry partners to uh, listen in on this. And so I work at Seattle City Light, which is the electric power utility that serves uh, Seattle and environs. And we have uh, some customers who are interested in using batteries initially, of course, in transportation. So our bus system, our ferry system, and then they want to move them to fixed uses. So some kind of a, a reliability or a resiliency usage. And I was really interested by the degradation uh, graph that you showed how age and usage impact it. I've usually, I've usually seen it only in the use. Uh, and I was wondering if that degradation is a measured value. Is there, is there a way to get a sense of how much oomph is left in the battery? That's a technical term. <laughs> uh, yeah, sure. That's, uh, that's some, some of our collaborators are working on and, and, um, um, I don't know the full details, but I do know they, they you know they can do certain measurements on the, the battery to estimate how much capacity is left. Um, but I, I do recall that once they do that, they have to take it out of its regular cycle, uh, you know, test cycle. So it kind of in, interferes with the, the regular regular testing they do do in the in the lab, but uh, so from what I understand, it's it's doable. It's but it's not straightforward to to do necessarily. There may be others on the in the audience that have more insights here. Right. So let me follow up that a little bit. So you can do this type test, but normally it requires a very slow cycling of the battery. So you can cycle the battery, let's say you know, very slowly over a day. Then you can sort of figure out how much energy is left in the battery. But that's, as I think said, is not a easy process. You have to take the battery out, you have to get a battery cycler, you have to do that. You know, it takes a long time to measure. So I think you know, a lot of question is, how do we operationally, how do we get an idea without going through this kind of you know, long and well testing process? Could I suggest that as a, a research project? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, yeah, folks from CI, maybe folks from CI here, I think they're you know, definitely focused on this. So. Any other questions? Hi, this is Mareldi from um, working with Professor Kirshen. And I wondered if in electricity markets, uh, you mentioned the cost reliability trade-offs and also the impact of extreme events. And I was wondering if um, there was also a look into the cost resilience trade-offs and sort of incorporating those um, low probability, high impact events into yeah. this. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I certainly think there is. Uh, I mean, I, I talked about this in very generic terms. Uh, so I, I guess if you think about that, that, that curve, the, uh, the light we are talking about expected costs to some extent, I guess. So the, you know, what's the expected cost of unserved energy? And then it becomes important, as you say, to not only consider the you know, central part of the distribution, but also the, the, the tails. Uh, but then the question becomes, how do you estimate those tails? Uh, how likely is that event in Texas to to happen? How, how you know when is the next search event co coming? And that's really tough to to answer, right? So um, uh, I think there's a really important research problem here combining um, the insights from climate science, right, on those people who try to measure or simulate those types of extreme events, and to kind of translate that type of, of knowledge into those types of, of trade-offs that. Uh, the power and energy infrastructure uh, industry has to make. So yeah, so I think it's part of the, of the trade-off to consider extreme events. Thank you. Okay, good. Uh, more questions? Okay, so if not, it's 11.30. Emily, I think we can end the recording. Then we'll uh, go to the other link for meetings. Thank you. Thank you.